Welcome to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm Peter Banatini, and here I discuss all things brain imaging with scientists from around the world. Today, it's my great pleasure and deep honor to talk with Dr. Marcel Meslem, who's a giant in the field of neurology and one of the founders of OHBM. Dr. Meslem is Chief of Behavioral Neurology and the Ruth Dunbar Davy Professor of Neuroscience at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and Professor of Behavioral Neurology at the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Meslem received his MD from Harvard Medical School in 1972 and in 1976, completed residencies at Boston City Hospital and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, also in Boston. After a one-year postdoc at Harvard University, he began his tenure uh, in Chicago at Northwestern. Dr. Meslem's work has been both prodigious and impactful over the years, as his almost 1,000 papers have been cited over 140,000 times He's written the seminal book, Principles of Behavioral and Cognitive Neurology, and has produced many landmark papers, a few of which we'll discuss on this podcast. One paper that I wanted to mention right here is what I consider a masterpiece. Published in Brain in 1998, entitled From Sensation to Cognition. I think this should be required reading of everyone in the field of brain mapping as it lays out so concisely and eloquently a breathtaking perspective of the structure and functional organization of the human brain. The writing is just amazing. Dr. Meslem's research is extremely broad and diverse, having impacted such areas as neural networks and functional imaging, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, primary progressive aphasia, cholinergic, cholinergic pathways, acetylcholinesterase studies, cognitive psychology, neurology, and neuropsychology. He's also developed early in his career a neuronal marker, tetramethylbenzidine, that profoundly impacted research in this area. In this inspiring conversation, we discuss his early career and what was important for his success. We delve into research culture and the value of opportunistic research, the value of having the freedom and resources to try many things in rapidly trained directions that follow interesting leads. We also discuss some of the exciting early days of neuroimaging and OHBM. Lastly, we go into some of his current research on primary progressive aphasia and the study of temporal pole disease as a window to the temporal pole functional significance. It was truly a pleasure to talk with Marcel. He's brimming with wisdom, as well as quite a bit of hard-won experience and knowledge. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Marcel, welcome. Thank you, Peter. I am really excited about this interview. It oh. also gives me an opportunity to see you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I haven't seen you in a while. Hopefully, I'll see you in person at one of these meetings uh, sometime soon. But so, why don't we um, start at the beginning um, with your uh, uh, just a little bit of how you started? Uh, you know what. What was involved? The serendipity. The you know what what major events maybe made a made a inroads in terms of your deciding uh, what to do. Um, and so you started in the early seventies, and you've been very active ever since. So I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like a long time, um, which it is. Uh, well, I think probably the most reasonable starting point would be when I was in college. And like every college student, I considered just about every major um, from astronomy to philosophy, anthropology, economics. And then um, I took a course on psychoanalysis on Freud. And uh, I was mesmerized and I pretty much decided that's what I was going to do. Um, but as I was pondering on that, it, 
you know, Freud uh, himself was a neuroanatomist. He started, I think, his first paper was something really on the testicle of some worm of some kind. It was he was pretty basic. And uh, then he went into this his discovery uh, through probably his interaction with Charcot at the Salpetriere. And um, but then he came to a point in his career where he wrote a paper, I think it was called Project on uh, Neuroanatomy or something, where he basically confessed that um, he had no hope that all of this was going to be linked to some neurology at some point or another. Um, that was a little bothersome. And at that time, you know, it's hard to believe, but the relationship of mind to body was still very murky. I mean, just showing that was sort of uh, an achievement. So I took a course in psychophysiology. So, you know, this was basically a glorified lie detector. So we would hook up people to heart rate, uh, pupillary uh, size, uh, respiration rate, uh, galvanic skin response, hmm. and make them do different things. I mean, one fascinating finding was that every time you were doing digit span, that you had a deceleration of the heart beat by beat. Um, and then, you know, whenever uh, you had some excitement, galvanic skin response was going up. And I was given the opportunity to run wild in the uh, laboratory. So I could go, you know, it was a William James building at Harvard and I had the keys. I would go in on weekends I actually hooked up one of my girlfriends and I asked her to think about the most exciting thing she could think of. And the polygraph went off the scale. Uh, I never know what she was thinking about. But, uh, you know, those were the findings uh, to say that really the mind and the body somehow are connected. And um, I wrote my thesis on something similar, well, related. My advisor was Charlie Gross, who probably you know well. He was uh, then at Harvard. Yeah. And I wrote my uh, uh, thesis in schizophrenia. I went to a state hospital and um, measured eye movements with a very primitive method while I was um, uh, giving a choice uh, between uh, two shapes to look at. One was symmetrical. The other had a little asymmetry. Uh, it was unusual. And I found in the chronic schizophrenics, now in the paranoid schizophrenics, they were like normals. They always looked more at the unusual shape. Hmm. Because it was novel. Yeah. And uh, in the chronic schizophrenics, there was a significant avoidance of the novel. So in a way, it was a behavioral measure of their withdrawal. So this was my undergraduate thesis. And obviously, by that time, it was clear which direction I was going to take. Uh, in medical school, I um, ran into the man who has had the most influence on my career was Norman Geshwin. Uh, he had just published his uh, disconnection uh, syndromes paper. And um, I did my clerkship in medical school in his department. And believe it or not, the first case I was asked to examine as a medical student had an, uh, uh, had an occlusion of the left posterior cerebral artery. So that gave him the classic syndrome of pure alexia without a graphy. So here is a person who can write beautifully, but can't read what they wrote. Hmm. Oh, wow. And also because uh, the artery supplied the hippocampus, the person also had an amnestic syndrome like HM. Hmm. Well, you know, once uh, you see a patient like that and <laughs> you have the anatomy, and suddenly you figure out that 
you know, it's there's more than heart rate and uh, galvanic skin response. There's really something pretty, I mean, rationally wired in the brain that can explain very complex issues. Yeah. So that was pretty much um, the decision-making process. The um, uh, idea was to let everybody a great deal of freedom. Um, We were on the ninth floor of the Boston City Hospital. Every patient that was um, discussed by Geshwin, and occasionally as a visiting professor, we had uh, Jerry Letvin, Jerry Letvin, who wrote this um, incredible paper on what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain. I mean, it was way ahead of its time in single unit recordings uh, in a behaving animal. Um, uh, And uh, that atmosphere created a situation where every single patient, in addition being a patient that we cared for, was an experiment of nature that allowed us to ask questions about how the brain worked. And then, you know, one flight of stairs up was Deepak Pandya and Gary Van Heusen. I could just go into the lab and really just fool around. Wow. No one asked questions. I could... You know, I mixed solutions. I made all kinds of variations. My fingers were always tainted with silver nitrate solutions. Um, I got asthma. I had to go to emergency room because, you know, we didn't wear masks when we perfused animals with formaldehyde. Um, so uh, that was the excitement that yeah. uh, um, uh, led to my, I think, still existent passion for this uh, um, just, you know, exploring uh, how complex behavior is mapped on brain substance. You know, I know this is too long an answer to your question, but that's perfect. That's what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, no, this is perfect. And, and there's a lot in there that you mentioned that's really important. I think there's something to say for, well, one, obviously at their early times and even still now, it's like, you know, there's these interesting puzzles that are that you have just enough information to try to sort of delve in and get a little bit more information about the connection between, you know, the brain and the mind. And 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 also there's something to say, and I think that's really maybe lacking today is just this really enriching environment, like you were saying, where you could spontaneously go in and just do stuff and play around and try things. Um, you know, things are a little bit more regulated, a little bit more restricted. Every every experiment needs an IRB approval, or uh, which you know, obviously that's very important. But it's 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 interesting, and I and I have similar experiences with you know early days of fMRI, just trying things. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's it's it would be nice to try to figure out that balance uh, in a way that you know, obviously is safe and and useful, but allow more of that sort of spontaneous playing. I think you would foster more scientists like yourself. So yeah, that's, that's great. So, uh, um, okay. So that's, that's a, that's a great background. Um, and, and how would you say then, uh, uh, so you sort of described in some sense the, that your particular environment, um, what was the general culture like? I mean, was it, um, uh, you know, as far as, uh, specialties, uh, uh, was was there more siloing of of disciplines? Was there was there more of a were there sort of paths that were being pursued that were potentially dead ends? Or you know, it's like what what was what was the time like in terms of uh, the scientific culture? Well, you know, I've reflected on that, and I think every generation thinks it is very special, but I must say that something magic happened in the, I would say, late 70s and through the 80s. It was just, I mean, it was like being in a toy store. (laughs) Um, First, um, well, I don't know first, but one of them was this um, unbelievable 
research on single unit recordings in the monkey, in the behaving monkey. I mean, Vernon Mountcastle, uh, Hivarinen and Poranen in Finland, uh, uh, Sato um, and uh, uh, Sakata um, Ito in Japan. Um, I mean, suddenly, uh, I will never forget one experiment that really floored me. Uh, in the monkey, this was a go no go experiment. So, first, they teach the monkey that color uh, is the important thing. No, sorry, shape. So, a circle was a go, and a, a cross was a no go. So, the animal, they record from a unit that can make the distinction. And while the circle is go, you know, gives a nice, robust response. So then they change the contingency. Now color is the important variable. So green becomes no go. And suddenly this single neuron that gave a big response to a green circle gives no response to a green circle. <laughs> so how do you understand that circuitry? Yeah. And this was the kind of insight um, that then, in a way, made connectivity studies in the monkey brain absolutely essential. Yes. And there were people, I think, just about everybody, uh, many of whom you know in the general, uh, you know, who later came to the OHBM culture, you know, they earned their wings doing um, a connectivity study in the monkey. And there, it was unbelievable because already Hubel and Wiesel had created this notion of simple, complex, hyper-complex. There was a hierarchy. Yes. But there was in primary areas. And now as we work on the monkey, we find the hierarchy it was in the association cortex as well. Yeah, I think that created um, uh, developments uh, on how to understand these distributed networks that were overlapping and yet had an individuality of themselves. And then, you know, the third component was the revival of behavioral neurology in the United States, primarily because of Geshwin's influence. Mm -hmm. So suddenly the neurology, the clinical part, started to contribute patients that fit some of these things. There were people with akinetopsia. There were people with alexia. There were people with, uh, you know, uh, behavioral syndromes, uh, selective amnesias. And then, of course, the other huge uh, ingredient is functional imaging, which initially started with PET. But, you know, PET was a rich man's club. Yeah. Very few places could afford a cyclotron, a PET, and so on. And then fMRI came up. It was a common man's, you know, tool. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, you were very much part of the creation of that. You know, I just, I read many years ago your summary on the 20-year history of fMRI. And yeah. uh, those were ingredi the ingredients. And, uh, you know, you couldn't help but be very excited about the field. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, there's always this excitement that comes from, right, not only a, you know, a new method for, for making a better sort of measurement, but also, you know, new new sort of model or construct that sort of opens up questions. Uh, yeah. And, 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 Definitely. So as far as I was, just had the question. So when, when that monkey, when I, I, I missed, uh, where was that neuron uh, when they were? Uh, uh, yeah. Orbital frontal cortex. In the orbital frontal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And of so, course, that led to the Tremblay and Schultz uh, findings, which were equally exciting, where uh, they found a monkey who um, loved apples, but not raisins. <laughs> um, and... So, um, and also didn't like something even less. I think it was just pieces of dry corn or something. So, 
Uh, let me see if I can reconstruct that. Uh, yeah, so uh, the neuron in orbital frontal cortex was very excited about the apple, not with the others. Hmm. But then they took the apple away. And that neuron gave a much more um, uh, vigorous response to the raisin. Hmm. We initially didn't get that. So again, the computational architecture is that somehow that neuron is sensitive to real-time changes in motivational value. I mean, I think these are the kinds of things that just make you... Uh, <laughs> I uh, wonder what what in what are we dealing with? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and we're still, I think, barely scratching the surface of really understanding that. I mean, it seems that you know you mentioned right. There's this this hierarchical but distributed sort of network that has parts, yet they're overlapping. And you know, it's really hard to uh, to put it all together in in terms of you know behavior still. And so we still, I think, have a long way to go. But I mean, this is this, you're right, you're looking at the very beginnings where people had really these deep insights into into these measurements that motivated this. this is, yeah, that's why I have a big laugh. When there is all this excitement about artificial intelligence. <laughs> I mean, the people working there have no idea about what real natural intelligence is about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And, and yeah, trying to have a simple model of what's going on and applying that to the brain, that's a place to start maybe, but, but yeah, I think we'll find it's, it's much more, you know, probably much more complex yet what much more elegant than we, than we have any idea of yet. Um, so, so, you know, you keep on, so even from the start though, so, so many people just go into medical school and they become practicing clinicians. You, uh, uh, you practice, but also, I mean, you're, you've always been doing research. How difficult was to establish that sort of research part of, of what you have been doing? Um, you know, I really have to give a tremendous amount of credit to Gershwin, Van Heusen, Pandya. They were so welcoming and so generous. And it was an atmosphere that was so saturated with hypotheses, speculations, incredible competitiveness. I mean, every time, every week or month, when we got the latest issue of Journal of Comparative Neurology, we were scared, we were scooped about uh, some connection or another. Um, it, it was really swashbuckling. It was like the Wild West. <laughs> and and the beauty was, and again, no offense to functional imaging, <laughs> but, you know, what's the percentage of functional imaging discoveries that get confirmed <laughs> by other experiments? In anatomy, once you find a pathway, it's eternal. There is nothing that is going to change. I mean, the excitement of that kind of when we found out all the you know arrangements of auditory cortex, of how uh, the hierarchies work, the amygdaloid connections, hippocampal fields, uh, it was uh, indescribable. It was, um, so um, once that happened, it was impossible to just go and become a clinician, especially <laughs> in neurology, where we usually give very bad news to patients. And the only way to prevent deep depression was to have research that uh, was a sort of um, uh, an upper. Hmm. So I've continued that, but, uh, you know, I've been lucky that um, the finances were not an issue. Um, now, I've been continuously NIH funded, believe it or not, since 76. So wow. I did get a lot of uh, funding, but that would not have been enough. I mean, I couldn't have built a laboratory if Pandey and Van Heusen didn't open the doors for me. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I've just been fortunate. Yeah, that's, 
And that's great. That's, that's in- incredible. So as far as, yeah. And so you have your lab and then, and you have your practice and it's, and this is part, this is, ex- you know, it's interesting when I, when I talk to young, uh, you know, people who are trying to pursue like MD PhDs or whatever, they, you know, they, I mean, I think that they, they just sometimes are just ambitious and they just want both. And, and it's like, really it's for doing clinical research and, you know, and you have a setup, you've always had a setup that is extremely complementary as far as that's concerned. And, and it's, you know, the, the ideas from one translate to the other. Um, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, jumping ahead maybe a little bit, but not, we can jump back. And, and, and that, that's the idea of uh, uh, translation. And certainly you do this in your research in terms of your ideas, uh, but uh, how difficult is it? I mean, I know that maybe at a individual patient level, you can translate your understanding to the patient to some degree, but how hard is it to to get your findings? Uh, you know, how hard is it for them to, or the techniques to make traction clinically? As far as you mean, you mean to become useful? <laughs> <laughs> well, not not to become useful, but even like you know, you know, FDA approval and, and or, you know, yeah, how, yeah. How, there's different I, levels of this. Yeah, yeah I've uh, well, I did dabble once with cholinergic treatments and I got uh, IND and uh, uh, it didn't go. I'm not made for clinical trials and developing. I, you, I guess I kind of don't research. like to be rich. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, the translation um, is really uh, more, uh, let me put it this way, that Look at the difference between NSF and NIH, that uh, NIH has a mandate from Congress to uh, heal people to, um, um, and then when you write your grant proposal, you fill it up with this so-called translational part and so on. And most of it, I must say, is either naive or just, uh, overreach. Yeah. Um, but then look at astronomy. I mean, you throw out the web telescope and all sorts of things. And I'm sure the translational part says, you know, we're going to get uh, meteorites and find rare earth metals yep. and so on. But really, deep down, we want to understand the universe. Yep. How did it start? What did it? I have to confess that my approach has been to be curious about how um, we can understand brain function. Now, many of our, my, my patients have appreciated the insight they get into their disease and so on. Yeah. But I wish I could say that I have a new drug that I've developed, a new pill. Uh, I haven't, though, in my cholinergic work, I have indirectly contributed to the cholinesterase inhibitors. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, uh, the main goal in that work was pretty much uh, the neuroscience of cholinergic projections. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I love your analogy with with astronomy. That's perfect as far as uh, you know. Right? There's no way. I mean, with astronomy, uh, you know, to you know, practical applications. Are we? You know, we might eventually travel to other planets or whatever, but, uh, but right. Um, and, and I completely agree that, you know, what you write in NIH grants, as far as the translation versus what probably is the real impact of all of this, the, the pure curiosity and the deep understanding of the brain is, is much more nuanced, uh, and more significant in the long run than any sort of, you know, immediate timeline. <laughs> So yeah, I, I and there's a value to that, and I think it should be brought out more. I completely agree with that. That it just is, and in itself, understanding the brain. So let's just shift gears a little bit and and maybe talk a little bit about OHBM. So uh, uh, you and I have both have been part of that since the very beginning, um, and and uh, and and you know this podcast goes to most most people who are in the OHBM community and sort of associated with it. Uh, so what was your, I mean, I could, I could spend podcasts on talking about OHBM and its history, but, uh, but I'm curious from your, about your perspective of, 
you know, what was it like starting out? And what was it like, you know, having this first meeting? And you know, what was it again, like? let me put a little background that uh, when we were dealing with all these issues, uh, not issues, opportunities, single unit recordings, so on and so forth, something came up. I think it was Denmark, Ingvar, uh, who was doing carotid injections and finding out that uh, during um, I think it was a digispan task that there was more blood in the front lobe. Hmm. Now, initially, uh, I didn't believe it. I mean, if I were to design a brain, why would I create a situation where I needed more blood when I was doing, you know, function? Uh, I mean, it seemed wasteful. Um Huh. And then too much control. Where is the controller that puts the blood there? And then, of course, a PET scan came in, SPECT scan and PET scan. Yep. And uh, those were very exciting. And, you know, especially in the uh, Hammersmith group. Um, and um, But then, you know, you needed cyclotron, as I said, and so on didn't work. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, the seeds of imaging were there. And then for me, when did Jack Belliver publish his science paper? Was it 91? On yeah, the, that was 91. 91, yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, still in Boston then. I got a call from Jack. Hmm who said, you know, you won't believe this. You have to come down to Charlestown. We have this MRI that when we do a checkerboard stimulus that you see something in the occipital cortex. Now, he, I think he only had use of the magnet on Saturdays. <laughs> so now in those days, my wife and I had a house in Provincetown on the Cape and we religiously went there Friday evening and came back Sunday. But I made an exception that day. I told her, I said, look, this is looks great. So I go down to Charlestown and Jack and his team are there. And that's the one day where it didn't work. There was something <laughs> wrong with the magnet or so on. So I sort of left with mixed feelings about uh, this method. Well, of course, then it just simply exploded. And uh, then there was this meeting in uh, the San Rafaele Hospital in Milan in 1992, hmm. uh, where, um, you know, I still have a picture of that. Very hard to recognize all the people that were over 100 people. But, you know, Brenda Milner was there, Mort Mishkin was there, um, a very, very young Carl Friston, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Richard Fukoy, and so on. These are some of the people I recognize there. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, uh, you know, uh, one of the people I had a chance to talk to was Justine Sargent, who uh, at that time uh, was writing these beautiful papers about face recognition and so on with PET. And uh, then, you know, with MRI and so on, of course, Bernard Mazoyer had this idea to put a Paris meeting together yeah. in, in a godforsaken suburb of Paris that uh, I remember a long uh, metro um, uh, trip. But what a meeting. Uh, what a meeting. It's, uh, um, you know, and at that time, I only salivated at people who did functional imaging. I had no ability to do that. And so I wanted to be critical. I, uh, I think I gave the analogy in my talk of functional imaging to a rose that has beautiful petals, but also a lot of thorns, and that it was important to understand how far we were from the anatomy and physiology we found out in the monkey to be able to get to that level. And then I had the opportunity to do some functional imaging. I worked on spatial attention 
uh, and that's where some of my network ideas came through. And uh, so I became part of the uh, of the community of OHBM. And then, you know, we had this exciting Boston meeting. Yep. Um, <laughs> that was the fight, yeah. whether we should call it a society for human brain mapping of organization for human brain. I mean, there were strong feelings. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, then the decision was made. And then we went through a period where uh, there wasn't council yet. There were some committees, that, yep. then elections, then council. And then I remember the Brighton meeting yep. where I introduced uh, LNL to uh, the council and said, we really need an administrative uh, office. And um, we had the great luck to have Laurie Anderson yes. as the first administrator. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> people look at societies and give credit to the luminaries who are president and had a Laurie, I think, deserves credit for putting OHBM on the map. Yeah, And uh, it's with her that we were able to go on and uh, have one great meeting after another, including the one I hosted in Chicago, and especially the one that I remember, who I really was the key to my deciding to write Sensation to Cognition, was the Copenhagen meeting. Um, yeah. And the, one of the reasons, maybe, was it was such lousy weather. <laughs> I had to be inside and look at every single abstract, and uh, it was exciting. Yeah, yeah, that was, I. Uh, yeah, I mean, they were really exciting times, not only because the method was new, but the community was coming together, and, and yeah, I remember uh, distinctly that room, actually, in Brighton, where, you know, I was in the room, uh, I think I was, I was on the education committee or something, and, uh, or maybe secretary, uh, and Lori Anderson, there were two groups. There was one group that that wanted to organize it that was not quite that good. But then there was Lori's group. And yeah, and it was wonderful. We just sort of decided on her. And little did we know how, how significant that would be. And yeah. oh, it was it was just amazing um, as, as far as because you really do need that infrastructure to grow in that way. Um, yeah. And you were chair for, you know, from 2000 to 2002 or, you know, you had the chair cycle where you pre-chair, chair, and post-chair, um, and, you know, spanning from San Antonio to Brighton to Sendai. And, but, but yeah, every single um, meeting uh, sort of, and it was interesting too. And I think what was interesting there, I mean, like you were saying, you were already sort of an established scientist. And so what was interesting about those early meetings, as I think about it, is that you already had very mature people in the field all coming together and, um, I think that that made for a really uh, um, it's hard to explain the atmosphere, but it was it was more like uh, they kind of from a top down sort of knew what to do and sort of, you know, it was exciting because these disciplines were coming together. These people, these actual established disciplines were were merging. Uh, yeah. So as, as now, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh yeah, that's and, and then you've been part of it ever since. And uh, uh, and I remember the Chicago meeting, which was which was great as well. Um, uh, so hopefully you'll we'll come back to Chicago one of these days. <laughs> yeah, I remember Lori organized it. So for the dinner, we actually had a boat more at the side of the hotel and we would get out of the hotel and go into the boat for yep. <laughs> uh, uh, Mich uh, Lake Michigan. Um, uh, sailing. Um, and then in Sendai, I don't know if you remember, I was uh, the chair then, and I went up to give my opening lecture, and there was this robot. Do you yep. remember the robot? Who yeah, came? Optimo. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember actually back then, it was a big deal that there was that, I mean, there's this robot. I mean, it's a little bit, it's still a big deal, but there it was like way ahead of its time. And I remember I actually had to do something too. I think I was part of some other committee, and and uh, and they just said, "Don't touch the robot." Just 
It's like, whatever you do, you can just let it talk. Don't touch it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was a really special time. I mean, that's actually what I, you know, I remember all of that. It was very exciting. And you felt you were really, there was something really exciting happening. And it was nice about the meeting itself is that it was less about, you know, certainly it was about the brain, but it was more about all these methods to bring together uh, to think about the brain, which was in itself exciting. So let's just maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, I, I, I hesitate because there's so, it's like jumping into an ocean, uh, sort of talking about your research. Um, and, and, you know, rather than, uh, you know, you've, rather than go into, you know, it's hard to know whether to go into depth into one thing or to keep it broad, but I mean, you've studied everything from, you know, the basic neuroscience to, you know, clinical manifestations of, you know, you know, dementia, as you mentioned, cholinergic pathways. Uh, you're, I think, one huge area, and I think maybe worth talking about a little bit is primary progressive aphasia, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, of course, uh, with your center, uh, um, uh, and then general cognitive psychology, uh, cholinesterized studies, and uh, and also you wrote pretty much this, the this, the book uh, principles of behavioral and cognitive neurology. Um, so I don't even know how to begin, um, other than uh, asking. Uh, you know, you have this broad spectrum, and you know what is your style of. You know, it seems like uh, you're very curious and you're very nimble in uh, finding interesting areas and jumping in, but at the same time, keeping this general program running. Um, so how has that maybe evolved over the years as far as that's concerned? Um, you know, I've really always been opportunistic. Um, I am not devoted to any single method. Um, and, uh, I just try to do my best to jump into opportunities. Suddenly a very special patient that opens a new insight, um, a kind of disease that I become an expert in and people come to me from around the country. I can do research or some imaging method that one of my colleagues develops and we get some, um, new uh, ways to approach questions. Uh, some, uh, you know, in our center, every participant uh, agrees to brain donation after death. So we have an extensive neuropathology uh, collection. Uh, since I have had the center for 29 years, when patients even though we like to have them live forever, they do die. And we have a unique collection of uh, post-mortem material on different diseases, different syndromes. So we have a team that works on that kind of correlations at a deep level. Um, so I don't have to do anything. I sit in my office. I, it's open door policy. I still have a microscope what you're looking see if you yeah. see in the background the boxes contain about twenty thousand slides of wow. uh, autopsy material each with a clinical history with longitudinal follow-up longitudinal imaging um and i have a bunch of very smart um some junior some not so junior people and they seem to think I have something to contribute. So they bring me results. <laughs> and we think about them. We interpret them. And we put them in context. And uh, sometimes there's, there are some areas of research which I consider my own. And then I lead that. But they interact with everything else. You know, we this center... Um, which is not in any department, reports to the dean of the medical school, is entirely multidisciplinary. So in one floor, I have people from neurology, psychiatry, preventive medicine, radiology, pathology, 
cell and molecular biology, uh, neuroscience, they are all together. And then the brain bank, where there are floating brains, is right next to the cognitive lab, where we do ERPs. Yeah. So this kind of, I mean, you wouldn't believe it. We have neuropsychologists, you know, neuropsychology students who had neuropsychology training, which is great, but doesn't include much basic science, who yeah. decided to go into neuropathology. Hmm. We know we have. <laughs> <laughs> which is just, wow. I think, because I try to create the bubble that Geshwin created for me. Yeah. That I could let people, because I have some discretionary funds that I can use to give people some freedom to uh, try things that yeah. um, uh, is new to them. So that's uh, my environment. That's that's amazing, and that's actually really. I mean, it's rare. It is hard to build. Uh, you have to be a little bit, you know, fortunate, but also at the same time very very skilled at at certain things in terms of growing these. Um, you know, I almost think it's it's almost like. I mean, it reminds me of the models of like at Max Planck Institute. You you have sort of a a principal, and then you have their groups, but it's not quite as inter- interdisciplinary as as even your your group. Uh, and I, I think there's there should be some that should be studied because uh, I think that <laughs> that there are incubators of good research and and there's a principle by how they should be organized potentially. But but Peter, there are always thorns to the rose. <laughs> so I have had to pay a huge price because departments are very jealous of what's happening here. And they say, well, we need the credit and the money and so on. So, you know, I have had to do a lot of politics and a lot of constraints because as a center, I cannot give primary appointments. So I have to negotiate with uh, departments to and so on. Uh, so I could have grown a lot more. And I haven't, but then the pleasure and the science have been very interesting. But I uh, kind of just realized that I haven't answered your question about uh, primary progressive aphasia. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a disease that I sort of defined again by serendipity um, in the 80s. I had one patient after another, I mean, not after another, but it just came a bunch of patients over months, maybe a couple of years, who had a progressive language loss. So at that time, there was a dichotomy. If you had an aphasia, you had a stroke. If you had a progressive disease, it has to be memory and Alzheimer's disease. And these were neither. In fact, what was funny we had CAT scans in those days, not MRI. And so they would go to a neurologist and the neurologist would say, well, you have a stroke, but we can't see it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it turned out to be this degenerative disease. And over the years, uh, I've been mesmerized by that disease because it just almost made for me, it was a network disease. Yeah. And it uh, hit different parts of the hierarchy and we could dissect it into different uh, components. Then we found out that uh, in addition to classifying it clinically, every type of PPA could be caused by several different uh, neuropathological types, the common denominator being the anatomy. Yeah. So we had a three-layered cake. We had clinic, anatomy, pathology, And then there was this asymmetry. I mean, there were patients who, for 10 years, had only the left hemisphere showing degeneration. So here's a disease that knows to turn left (laughs) uh, and stays there. Uh, So what happened over the years, you know, people say, why in the world would you become specialist in PPA about so rare? Yeah. That it's not even worth mentioning. Nobody, you know. But what we've done over the years, and I hope this is appreciated, 
that we made PPA a paradigm yep. for studying uh, anatomy, brain, pathology, anatomy relationships. Uh, and uh, that's why I think it is important out of proportion to the rarity and frequency of the disease. And, and do you think there are clues in PPA as to how Alzheimer's progresses in general? Or, I mean, I'm also wondering if there's other net, I mean, is there a, the equivalent of PPA in, you know, visual cortex? Or is there other networks that are selectively hit and, and uh, in this way? Well, there are. Um, I mean, you mentioned visual cortex. Um, there is a certain form of Jakob Kreutzfeil disease, it's mad cow disease. It's called the Heidenhain form, hmm. and it hits preferentially visual cortex. Then there is a subtype of Alzheimer's disease caused uh, posterior cortical atrophy, it's, that's its clinical name. And believe it or not, the tangles, which are usually focused in the hippocampus here, uh, they become focused in occipital cortex, hmm. including the superior colliculus. Huh. Uh, and then there's an aphasic form of these diseases, and then, of course, a behavioral form, uh, an amnestic form. So now, is it the case where it hits only one network? No, I don't think we can simplify that way. It's just that we like to classify disease by the initial conditions. So if initially the disease hits a certain network, things are very clear. But if you wait long enough, this is a spreading disease. And then the criticism is, well, you know, it's a diffuse condition. Don't make it look like is initial. But, you know, that depends on your concept of specificity. And again, I want to mention using this as a paradigm, yeah. because the experiment of nature is the initial condition, not the terminal condition. So, so I mean, in, in, as far as the, the mechanism, I mean, is it is it uh, basically, I mean, so how does the pathology transfer? I mean, you can imagine it transferring from neuron to neuron, and then it's sort of along this sort of network pathway. Is it is it by neural activity, or is it by other sort of anatomic connections? Is it is uh, um... <laughs> we, you know we have speculations. Okay, uh, first left versus right, or language cortex. Um, one finding is that the PPA patients and their first degree relatives have a higher incidence of dyslexia than others. So we have this speculation that there is a developmental or genetic uh, vulnerability of the language cortex hmm. that in some people causes a developmental problem. In others, it's compensated by plasticity but makes that area vulnerable hmm. to an independent neurodegenerative disease. So this is the uh, approach of um, um, uh, uh, locus of least resistance. Okay. Okay. Um, now, that doesn't explain all the cases, but certain families follow that. Now then, um, there are other observations that are almost, I don't know what to say, almost incredible. This is now my current research. It's a condition called um, FTLD TDP type C. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice, uh, simple. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So this is frontotemporal lobar degeneration with abnormality of uh, the transactive response DNA binding protein 43 <laughs> of type C. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, it's an abnormality of a normal protein known as TDP43, which deposits as toxic inclusions. And believe it or not, this type C hits preferentially the temporal pole. Huh. Huh. Now, 
it could be unilateral, left, unilateral, right, or sometimes bilateral. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, suddenly, the temporal pole that was really a terra incognita, because, yeah. you know, first, there was a lot of susceptibility in MRI. Uh, secondly, I mean, yes, you could correct for some, but nonetheless, noisy. Yeah. Uh, uh, then it wasn't vulnerable to stroke because it had triple vascular supply. And then you couldn't examine the patient if there was a wound there because the person would die. It's yeah. too, you know. Yes. So nothing was known about this area, almost nothing. And with TDPC, you know, we got into these findings. You know, there are these patients who come in and... If you had a conversation with them in a cocktail party, I mean, you wouldn't know that there's anything wrong. But then look at them and say, no, you wouldn't do that. It was wouldn't be polite. But if you happen to say, you know, look at them and say, what is a pumpkin? And, you know, they look at you and say, pumpkin. <laughs> is that a game? <laughs> And they lose the ability to comprehend single words. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Now, if it's on the right side and then there is some bilaterality, they lose the ability to recognize objects and faces, but they understand the meaning of the world, of the word. And if it's bilateral, it's a combination of all. <laughs> and yet these people... Um, I mean, I had a patient who was still running a bed and breakfast. I have others who, I mean, think of it this way. If you go to a country where you don't understand the language and, uh, you know, um, you can still function. Yeah. The other thing these people show is a phenomenon known as taxonomic um, interference. So you ask them, bring me a banana. They will bring you an orange, but not a spoon. <laughs> you tell them, bring me a hammer. They are likely to bring scissors, but not a banana. So the word is understood in a generic sense. So I'm having a field day wow. studying these patients. We have a very rare collection. And we're approaching it in a neurocognitive way by um, serial um, longitudinal uh, examinations, ERPs, uh, DTIs, and so on. And uh, then we're doing uh, site-specific transcriptomics to see if there is something special about the temporal pole that gets hit. And then we're doing cryo-electron microscopy to see if these deposits have something special affinity for the temporal pole. Hmm. Now, all of this is with international collaborations, our contribution is to provide tissue, DNA, plasma, and clinical information. Right now, that's my passion. That's, in fact, we gave it a grandiose name of Consortium in C. And uh, that's uh, what uh, keeps me awake sometimes at night, figuring out what in the world can, can yeah. determine such yeah. specificity. That is so interesting. I mean, I, you're right. As you mentioned, fMRI has a hard time getting into there. But I mean, to the extent that we have, I mean, there's there's you know something to say for the potential for you know you know there's a face area, but there's also I mean that's not in the temporal the poles. But then but then there's like it, recognizing individual faces, like you know one face from another. Yeah. Uh, there's some hints that there it might be there as well. So it's that's really I mean there's that's really interesting and and it's amazing how you know, the pathology, you try to understand that in, in general, but how it, if you look really carefully and uh, like you are, it provides clues um, that we might be able to figure out something profound. And, you know, Peter, also this is where <laughs> being around for a long time helps because, you know, it took 25 years to put together this group of uh, very special patients. Uh, yeah. they, if PPA is rare, uh, this TDPC is 10 times as rare. So, wow. I mean, it's a form of PPA, but it's a rare form of PPA. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, okay. That's, I mean, I could write, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's really, really exciting. I mean, it's exciting and, and, you know, and, and so just to, to generally switch gears a little bit before we talk, I mean, I know we're running uh, maybe potentially shorter time, but I'll try to keep you a, a little bit longer here. Um, this is such a great conversation. Um, uh, for the sort of the general, I mean, I, obviously this, this podcast is for uh, maybe all the young listeners, but I think a lot of us, you know, we're aware of so much funding going to, into Alzheimer's disease research. And, and, and I always hear about, you know, sort of deeper understanding of, you know, what are the mechanisms and what are the types? Uh, but as far as the treatment, I, I, you know, it still seems like, you know, at least that, you know, what's translated to general practice has still been, uh, you know, you're just trying to slow it down a little bit. Um, is, is, do you have any, you know, Thoughts on I probably you have many <laughs> on on the most promising treatments or you know what the prospects are or things like that or how does understanding uh, translate the treatment? Yeah, I wish I could say I do, and I should also preface by saying that I hold a minority view on Alzheimer's disease. I am not impressed by amyloid. Um, uh, so I wrote a paper once. Um, I was a review in Neuron about a theory of plasticity. Um, I look at Alzheimer's disease, especially its relationship to aging, as a plasticity failure, um, a number of conditions that converge to increase the metabolic price that we have to pay for housekeeping activities such as synaptic turnover. And it's like mortgaging your house or failing to paint it. And so we call it degeneration, but actually it's a lack of upkeep over time. And uh, I think the tangles and the amyloid are messengers that bring bad news hmm. and it doesn't help you to kill the messenger so now the problem with my theory is that you know it's unprovable and uh, you can not disprove it either so it's rightly uh, criticized i accept all the criticism but you know that's my hypothesis so i am a little bit skeptical about, and I can give you about 20 different reasons why the amyloid theory doesn't hold. Yeah. Um, but um, the, do I have another? I don't, but I think that um, possible, we have to protect synapses. So one player that is involved by the microglia. The microglia eats synapses. And there is a lot of my, I mean, they help in most people because they help the turnover and yeah. they eat up, you know, dysfunctional synapses. But when they do it um, uh, too much, then um, that's not good. Yeah. So I think that's one angle that I feel is promising. So going for the inflammatory aspect of Alzheimer's disease, uh, maybe the issues of oxidative stress. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, none of this is particularly helpful. Everyone has their own cascade that uh, explains everything based on animal models, none of which are perfect. So I, I wish I could be, um, you know, we started this, I don't know, three, four decades ago when the first gene was discovered on Alzheimer's disease, the autosomal dominant form. And everyone said that was, that was it, that, hmm. uh, and I must say that uh, genetic discovery um, hasn't answered all the questions. Interesting, and and <clears throat> right, obviously, with the hope that uh, 
you know, once you know the 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 causal mechanism, then you can start to get at the the prevention and the treatment. But so, I mean, this is really interesting as far as the you know the you know that you're saying that the amyloid might be a signature, but a byproduct, and not really something that actually interferes. So, what about um, you know? I just I you know it just reminds me it's a sort of tangential idea that I was just reading a paper on on fMRI signal changes with activation and uh, a revamping of the model saying it's not to deliver oxygen to the tissue, but it's to remove waste. Uh, uh, and so that's what you need. A pH, you need a constant pH and to re- removal of, of you know, uh, byproducts of metabolism. Is, could it ultimately be a vascular related <laughs> thing as well? <laughs> you know, if by vascular you mean things that are much more subtle than a plumbing, yeah. It's conceivable. I mean, you know, we've looked at a few things like blood-brain barriers and this and that. There's nothing obvious, yeah. but could it be something very subtle like uh, transendothelial transport, uh, something at the capillary control, uh, something with the glymphatics that, uh, you know, all of these are, that's why I'm saying that we are at a stage now where no theory can be completely, well, I mean, if you said it's uh, cosmic rays, uh, that would be sort of not likely. But, uh, you know, any any theory goes at this point. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we're struggling to find something that's consistent. Yeah. That's so, I mean, you have so many tools and all the more reason to have multidisciplinary approaches and, uh, you know, to break down the barriers between the departments and to, to focus on this sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I know we're running short of time, but I just wanted to mention, you know, I had, you know, as part of my research, I did, you know, just tried to take a good look at four papers that you had, but I, I just wanted to focus on maybe one. I mean, you have, you have a couple of, you know, what people would call classics in the literature, <laughs> not only classics, but ones that they should read, uh, uh, Maybe everyone should take take a good look at these. Um, you know everything from your uh, uh, tetramethylbenzidine, uh, you know horseradish peroxidase, that a method of staining that really helped neuroanatomy substantially. Uh, that was just you know uh, extremely useful. Uh, you also had uh, you know obviously your your classification of primary progressive aphasia uh, paper in neurology in two thousand eleven. Uh, 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 you had some general papers uh, that were just classics of, uh, you know, Annals of Neurology in 1990, large-scale neurocognitive networks and distributed processing for attention, language, and memory. But the paper that actually really struck me, and, and I just, and I don't exactly know why, because uh, it, it's, it was just a beautiful paper, I thought, it was in Brain in 1998. And and you probably, uh, you know, it's, it's from, from sensation to cognition, uh, and, and I think the reason why it struck me uh, were, was it was a, just a beautiful review article of basically the state of the art of what you know in the field about pretty much every aspect of what we care about <laughs> in the brain and uh, what the entire field of OHBM cares about. Uh, and and I, as I was reading it, one, it's timeless in a sense that nothing, you know, there are aspects of it that uh, you know, obviously have been filled in in terms of the details, uh, but but nothing is, uh, you know, everything is still there. And and I actually have to say that the art of, and this is what I find uh, in, often in young uh, younger scientists and even older scientists that the art of clear writing is is really I feel not uh, trained as much. And um, uh, and and. When you read your your summary of that paper, I really felt like it it was as close to poetry as uh, <laughs> as, as as something I would have read. And I just am curious uh, what your thoughts on how you wrote that paper and how you how you actually hone your your skill of of writing uh, because it's it truly is a pleasure to read and because you can actually feel the concepts happening in your head as you're reading it. You're not like trying to understand something. You could actually, it feels like you're just sucked in. Uh, it's, it's really, really good. <laughs> I'm so 
I'm so happy to hear you say that because I felt really excited when I was writing that paper. And there were several. Uh, one was the Copenhagen meeting, which really struck me that we were at a point in the field where we could translate the monkey findings into the human. And that was also a time of reflection for me because I just moved from Harvard to Northwestern and I was putting together the center. And then I was also getting prepared to write the second edition of my book. So it was a time when um, I did some reading and um, again, single unit recording papers were coming out with great speed. So I did a lot of reading and uh, um, it occurred to me that this was time to put together the hierarchical uh, notion, which was really very simple on the surface um, about uh, that would combine all cognitive activity around a common structure, a common uh, scaffolding, a common matrix that you could understand things uh, in terms of bottlenecks, in terms of not really, you know, not modular, but uh, interacting uh, uh, networks that had different bottlenecks that we then call the critical areas. And then to figure out that uh, the, uh, the message is in the medium, not to get sucked in in any single method. Now, func uh, single unit recording gives a different reality because, good God, you're recording one of 40 billion neurons. So uh, before you make a conclusion, just you know, wait a little bit. Yes. Now, then functional imaging. Well, you know, let's assume I do behavior A and I have six different areas of activation. Well, you never can tell which is critical, which is corollary. Yes. And then you look at stroke. Well, you know, yes, you have a lesion, but good God, the white matter <laughs> is involved and who knows where this is going. Then you look at progressive disease, degenerative disease. Well, wait a minute. Because in stroke, it's like you pull a plug and the lights are down. In degenerative disease, it's like a short circuit that just spreads through other parts of the brain as there is plasticity and degeneration. Yeah. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that the methods give you different kind of uh, visions of how the brain is put together. And I had the opportunity in 98 to uh, you know, think about these things, and yeah. I put them on paper. Most of it was written on weekends, um, and um, you know, um, I, I still feel the excitement as it unraveled, especially when I came to the final section, and um, I was sort of thinking about the invention of writing. Yeah, yes. And I wrote this, uh, I read this little anecdote where it says that invention, I mean, uh, writing was invented by a Sumerian king who had this favorite messengers who had a terrible memory. <laughs> so instead of losing the messenger, the king invented writing. <laughs> <laughs> so the messenger could bring things without forgetting them. Yeah, and that and that's and you had a beautiful description of right. It's like you know we didn't evolve to to read and uh, uh, you know what sort of process that might be involved in, and also the idea that writing, in some sense, is is uh, you know the, the the preservation of of this collective knowledge that we can then ratchet forward in civilization. I mean, you went all the way into how civilization, <laughs> how people, uh, you know, will grow with 
this use of, of civilization and preserved knowledge, which goes beyond our memories. It was fun. And I, in fact, I owe it, it to the editors of Brain to have taken another critical attitude and to have agreed to publish it. And I must say, one of my uh, memorable reactions, a letter that I still conserve, is from Vernon Mountcastle, who wrote me a handwritten letter uh, telling me that he had enjoyed reading the paper. Oh, wow. And uh, I really uh, treasure that letter. That's, that's, that's high praise and, and yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, uh, so, so just to, just to wrap up here, um, uh, uh, are there any parting words on the future? Any advice for young researchers, you know, just in general, uh, um, you know, you've given so many bits of insight as we've go, gone along here and, uh, yeah. Um, first, let me start with an analogy. Um, you know, in the old days, if you wanted to find gold, you just rushed to the West, staked a claim, and started digging. Today, if you want to dig gold, the bureaucracy you have to go through is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, uh, Species preservation, environment, um, are you infringing on uh, such and such land? And I think that we've gone through that sort of uh, evolution that, you know, in my case, I, I mean, I was, as I said, protected. And today it's very hard for young people, you know, there's this issue of young investigators that are supposed to be in a different track for NIH funding, but it's a joke because yeah. you know, <laughs> that's that young has a different uh, definition at NIH. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you have to have uh, uh, information and uh, preliminary results, which is really not my definition of um, uh, letting people start. The K Awards, which actually I think I was partly um, there in the movement that put them, uh, created them because mm -hmm. as clinicians, we didn't have that opportunity, uh, are, are very flawed in their uh, structure. So all I would say to young investigators, try to be lucky and uh, find a place where the mentor can create a bubble, protective bubble, um, at least in part, to create that initial um, uh, spark that's going to... Um... And then the other thing I must say, and again, I know this is not a popular statement, that... You know, not everybody is fit for research. Yeah. And um, if you find that your expectations are just not being fulfilled, you know, maybe this is not uh, what you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's also right. I mean, a lot of people find that out too late or, right, they, they're, they're, you know, they just look at it as a mechanism for their career. But, yeah. And I think that, right, what defines that is self-reflection and, and what defines pretty much everything you've done is sort of, you know, this insight co that comes from, you know, working, but also taking the time to sit back to put things in perspective um, all the time. So, yeah. And yeah, taking time to do that and is an important thing. And and I agree. Yeah, that's it's it's hard. The, I didn't know that you were associated with the with the K Awards. Um uh, potentially, but, and I agree. I, I don't want to say that I was in any formal way. I have written letters to NIH about the lack of uh, 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 protected time for clinicians, but okay. whether or not it had any influence, I can't really pretend it, it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, one never knows, but still, either way, having, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, pushing in that direction, uh, I think, you know, one never knows exactly the mechanisms, but, uh, and I think you're right. I think that there needs, to, and I love the idea of creating these bubbles. Um, uh, maybe just using that concept to try to go forward, sort of, you know, making bubbles for your career, bubbles to think, bubbles to, to play, uh, to, to, you know, explore. But, I, uh, that's why I thought the uh, UK system with the MRC and the Wellcome Grants uh, to a laboratory head rather than to individuals is so wise because on one hand, it's undemocratic. So in the United States, probably it won't be very popular. On the other hand, it allows the chief to create bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. And, and we're still evolving those systems. So, but all right. Well, I mean, I, we could talk for hours, but uh, uh, I, I think that this is a good, good point in which to, to end this. I, this has been so fun. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the at the meetings in person. And uh, it's been it's been great talking to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. It's as I said, you know, uh, the art of interviewing is um, important. And I must say, uh, this was um, one of the most enjoyable interviews I've had in a long time. <laughs> well, well, likewise, same, the same with me, the same with me. Thank you. <laughs> Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Alfie Wine and Farouk Golban. <laughs> <laughs>